New day, new goals, let's own it. And in this episode of Leaders Create Leaders, I am extremely excited about our guest. He is someone that I really connected to since I was really young, learning about what it means to be a leader from my father. In fact, you know, my father used to leave these little notes around the house. And I remember, you know, the one of my favorite quotes is from Dale Carnegie, and it says, you know, to focus on your character, not your reputation, because your character is who you truly are. Your reputation is merely what people think of you. And it really, you know, for me, my character has always been what's most important. And on top of leaving these notes around the house, he also used to give me these books by an author who you may recognize today. He is the New York Times bestselling author, internationally known for selling over 30 million books on leadership and business. You know, he's a speaker, he's a coach that has worked with over six million leaders in every country around the world. He is someone who has worked with some of the top leaders. I'm talking about presidents, to Fortune 500 executives. He's won the Mother Teresa Award for Global Peace and Leadership. He is someone that I just have the utmost respect for. And you know, I think you're gonna get an immense amount of value because he's gonna be talking about not only all of his principles of what makes a great leader, but his new book, Leader Shift. So let's get to it and sit down with the leader of all leaders, someone that is truly influential, John C. Maxwell. John, wow, this is uh, such a like such an honor and, and an, an absolute privilege. Um, I want to just thank God right now for giving me this opportunity to be able to sit with you and connect with your soul, connect with your wisdom, and the opportunity to be able to just share this uh, this conversation and this wisdom with with our community, with leaders, create leaders. It's a uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, thank you, Gerard. I I feel the same. And when I look at somebody like you, young, and yet you're already making an impact, what a, what a terrific inspiration to so many other young potential leaders that look at you and say, boy, if Gerard can do it, I can do it. And uh, I can remember back in my younger early days how I was inspired by people like you. So, hey, thanks for having me. We're going to have a good time. Oh, yes, absolutely. I am so excited about leadership right now. I mean, talk to me a little bit about... Uh, the, this book compared to some of the other work that you've been doing, I mean, 30 million copies um, that you've sold. I mean, your, your books were the first leadership books that I've ever read in my entire life. And growing up, um, just to touch on it, like my father he used to write little notes around my house. He did two things. He used to write little notes around my house that I would find that were these quotes of different leaders. And I never really understood what he was doing at a young, like for me at a sure. young age. Um, and then he had your books as I, as I grew up. And um, that's why I had so, I'm so excited about, you know, sitting with you. And talk to me a little bit about, you know, leadership. Well, first of all, when, when I write a book, it's for a purpose. Uh, uh, and my purpose is very simple. I, I want to add value to leaders who can multiply value to others. So my crowd is, is a leadership crowd. That's why I love your show so much, because you understand leadership very well. You are one, and your, your show is, is geared to people that want to influence people and make a difference in, in people's lives. And so this book came about, I, I was getting ready to speak to a company a couple of years ago, and their theme was fast forward. And so they said, okay, that's our theme. Uh, kind of let me know what, you know, so I could kind of arrange my talk to kind of connect with them. And they said, what, what do you think fast forward means to you? I said, well, first of all, fast means faster. Uh, it, it's always getting faster. It's, it's not slowing down. I mean, you know, people sometimes say, boy, I can hardly wait for things to slow down so I can take a break and make some decisions. I look at them and say, you're going to be dead. I mean, it, they aren't slowing down. Fast is faster. And forward is shorter. 
And, and what I mean by that is when, when I started out, when I was your age as a young leader, we could have literally a 10-year plan. Uh, for our company or for our organization. And it was a long range plan. Five year was kind of mid range. Two year was short range. Mm. Well, you know today, a two, oh, yeah. somebody says they have a two year plan. You say, ooh, that's awful long. That's a, that's a long range plan. You see, life is condensed. Mm. And so forward is shorter and faster is faster. Again, when I started off as a leader, Gerard, uh, the big thing to lead was to see a bigger picture so that you could cast vision. So if, if, if I saw more than others saw, Pretty much, I got to be the leader. Well, today, more has been replaced with before. And as a leader now, it's how quickly do I see it? And because of the fast pace of time, I've got to be very agile. I got to be be able to make adjustments. I got to be able to make changes because nothing is set. Yeah. And if if I if I'm waiting for something to be set or for something to be solid, by the time I get it, I've already lost it. And I think this is very key. So I wrote leadership to help people understand a couple of things. One is that their leadership should be expanding. And to expand, it means that you, it should be changing. It should be shifting up to a, a higher level, a, a higher gear. So I wrote it to help people understand that no matter where you are as a leader, there are more shifts for you, for me, for all of us to make to be highly successful. And I wrote it to help us understand, I, I, I'm kind of like a guide, and I've been down the leadership road. Mm -hmm. And so I look at, I look at, I started to say kids like you, you're not a kid, but I mean, <laughs> you're young, okay. Yeah. I, I, Gerard, I look at you and, and, and so many of the people, that, of course, that you connect with, and, and I've been down the road. And it's kind of like, do you mind if I just kind of give you a little, little view of what the road looks like, and, 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 and you know, all of us can handle changes if we understand that they're coming and, and, and there's a kind of a awareness of it. Right. The, the change that we really resist and are not effective with are the ones that blindside us. And so Leadership is a book about, let me be your father, let me be your guide, let me go down the road before you, let me just say these changes are gonna come in your leadership yeah. and let me help you to become flexible and very quickly to adjust. And I know you have I know you have plan A, but as soon as you start moving, you better have option A and B and C and D in there because plan A does you know, the only the only time everything works is before it starts. <laughs> yeah. And the moment it starts, then we begin to find out what's happening. And the leader that can move the quickest is the one that's going to seize the moment and is going to have the majority of the, the leadership bounty that, that's for us. It's interesting to me because um I've had to make many shifts in my entire career sure. as, an, as an entrepreneur, but it, whether, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, even just as a, you know, as a human being, um, also as a leader, as a business owner or as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, I feel that like a lot of the people that I have coached, a lot of people that I've worked with, a lot of people I've mentored, a lot of people that I've sh worked with, like they, a lot of times they fear shifts they fear change you know and i even remember my last startup it was like like you mentioned when you start it's you know it's it's just about starting but then you just have to learn to adapt along the way but people a lot of the people that i would work with would fear that they would feel cha fear change they would fear you know adapting totally in fact let me have the book for just sure. second because if you look at the book leader shift the you know the 11 central changes every leader must embrace that is a very key word. Embrace the change. Because most of us don't. Right. Most of us resist the change. We, as you talked about, we fear the change. And, and because of this, we miss our moments. You know, I had a mentor uh, much older than me. Uh, you find that hard to believe now, but John Wooden, the great coach at oh, UCLA. Man. Yeah. He, for the last 13 years, he was my mentor. Wow. And, and, and he, he, one of his statements, uh, Gerard, was that uh, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. And, and he said, what you do is you prepare all your life so when the opportunity comes, you can seize the moment. That seed thought is part of this book. And so what I want people to look at opportunity and change and transition, I want them instead of to fear it as, as a foe, as, as somebody that's something that's trying to do me in and hurt me and set me back, I want them to look at it as a friend. Now, 
I, let, let's talk about attitude for a second. I've always said that the only time attitude shows up is during adversity. I, it, during good times, everybody has basically good attitude. I even know people that have a bad attitude that have a good attitude when things are all going their way, okay? So the only yeah, time it yeah. ever shows up is during adversity. It's the same thing with transition and change. When it shows up in our lives, our ability to embrace it and understand that it's an opportunity, because every opportunity I've ever had in my life, every opportunity you've had in your life was surrounded by problems, setbacks, difficulties, barriers. I, I, I've never had an open door that was just open. Right. And, and, and as I walked close to that open door, nothing but angels sang and, and, and birds flew and, and the sun shined and I walked through it and said, oh my gosh, I hardly knew I walked through that open door. It was so easy. No, no. If, 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 if it's an open door, as I start to go for, toward it, it shuts. Now what happens is when it shuts, most people stop. And one of the things I teach is the resources only come to you as you keep walking. And how many times you've seen, I've seen people say, well, you know, I tried that and it wasn't working, so I stopped. And it's the end of the story. Well, the end of the story was not the adversity, not the failures, not the difficulties. The end of the story was I stopped. No one ever wrote a book on I quit my way to success. Right. Or no one ever wrote a book on I, I feared my way to the top. Right. So what we have to understand is that every one of us have within us, I do, you do, all of, the, all of your listeners, all of us have within us a, a fear element and a faith element. We do. I have things that I look at, like, ooh, that suck, sucks some air and kind of gulp a little bit. I, I, I have that happen to me on a, on a continual basis. But I also have that faith voice that says, you know, you can do this. You can do this. Start. Try. Get in, get in the game. Now, what am I going to do? If my fear voice is greater than my faith voice, then that fear of failure and adversity and mistakes will stop me. But if my faith voice is larger, I'm not quieting the fear voice. I'm, yeah. When people say, well, get rid of your fears, I also say, yeah. gosh, you're delusional. That, that's not a problem. But what you do is you minimize your, and how do you minimize your fears? You minimize your fears by activating your faith. And the more that I operate in the do it so, the, 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 the less of the, I can't do it, you know. In, in the beginning, when I started off as young, I would look at a project or something and I'd ask myself, can I? You know, wow, whoo, that's a big mountain, can I? Well, anymore, I don't ask the question, can I? I ask the question, how can I? Mm. I've already accepted the fact I'm going. So it's, it, it, it's not a question, should I start? It's a question is, as I start, how am I going to overcome? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to uh, 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 be successful in this? And I, one more thing on this. I, I was talking to a very successful CEO the other day because in our John Maxwell company, we have an executive circle club where every month I talk to a successful CEO, they listen in, they do 20 minutes on their story, then I do some leadership applications and I ask some questions. And in the question period, Gerard, I ask him, about his mistakes and his failures. And I said, let's talk about what I call do-overs. I mean, we'll look back at your career and say, okay, I'd like to go back there and do that over. And, and if I could do that over, <laughs> if I could do that decision over, if I could, boy, if I could do that action over. And I said, so talk to me about what's, what's one of the do-overs you want in your life where you go back and say, oh, I wish I could go back and, and have another sh shot at that. And he said something very interesting to me. He said, you know, John, I, I don't think I, I don't think I would change anything. It got real quiet on the phone. He said, "No." He said, uh, "Now I made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of bad decisions, have had a lot of oh gosh regrets and oops and all." But he said, "I, I just don't think I'd go back and change anything." He said, "Because what I learned from my failures, the the character that I developed because of my missteps and bad decisions." have made me who I am today. Yeah. He said, I'm not sure I would be the person I am today without those failures and without those mistakes. 
And Gerard, I know that you would say the same thing. And let me say, I'm saying the same thing now. So when people begin to have the fear factor of, oh, I might fail and what happens and, and all this stuff comes in, I'm going to, I say to them, you will fail. You will have missteps. You will make bad decisions. You will get on the slippery side. Right. All of this is going to happen to you. So get started. It, first of all, if you don't get started, nothing's going to happen. And if you do get started, some good things are going to happen, but some bad things are going to happen. And it's the bad stuff that will help you to develop the character to handle the... See, the bad stuff helps you handle in the long run the big stuff. Right. And if you've not handled the bad stuff, the big stuff, you'll never get to it. And, and, and you know, it's, it's like I teach you, um, you know, I wrote a book a few years ago called uh, Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn. And, and I tell people all the time, don't, don't count your losses, count your lessons. Yeah. And we all have losses. And so to that person that's starting out, you're going to have losses. It's okay. In fact, those losses are going to make you better if, again, you have the right attitude to it. Again, if I have the wrong attitude, losses defeat me and I'm flat on my back. I love that. And I love how you bring up faith. And I want to dive into that a little bit more. And I'm excited to actually go into a lot more of the 11 principles um, in leadership. But I really want to touch on faith a little bit because before you really went into biz the business side of leadership, you were a pastor. And for me, one of the first things that has allowed me to become the man I am is was my faith. Yes. And, you know, I've, I've read how important the personal growth, you know, relates to the spiritual growth that allowed you to really become a leader. And I want to touch on that because so many, you know, millennials that I, that I work with, they, it's almost like they don't understand the concept of leadership. And before you can even lead an entire team, you have to, and I think this is something we both relate to, I've said this before as well, find that leader within. Yes, that's right. And my spiritual growth and, you know, tapping into God and tapping into my faith has a really truly been the foundation for me to become the leader I am today. Yeah. Can you take me back to that beginning of, you know, when, when really before it was business, what did it mean to become a leader through, just through faith and through understanding that, that personal development and spiritual development for yourself before you can even lead a team. Well, Gerard, thanks for asking that question. You know, faith's personal. And uh, a lot of times when I'm given the opportunity like you're giving me now, I talk about it. There are times when I don't, because I, I, I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but I just always feel badly for people who don't have faith. Um, so let's go for a moment to the greatest leader who ever lived, Jesus. Yes, yes. I mean, he's the greatest leader. I mean, yeah. I, I, this isn't anything spiritual here. This isn't Christianity. This right. isn't Bible 101. This is History Facts 101. Right. I, I remember one time looking at a scripture, that the, and the scripture kind of convicted me. It, and it was said very simply, Jesus is talking. Without me, you can do nothing. And I remember saying, ah, I don't think I believe that. I think there are a lot of things I can do without God. And, and, and I, I wasn't resistant. I wasn't anti. In fact, I was a person of faith, young in my faith, but I was a person of faith. But I could begin to talk about all the things I could do. And, you know, and, and so I kind of got my list together. And, you know, I did this. I, you know, and, and I mean, I don't mean this unkind. I didn't ask God to help me here. And I did this. And I did this. And, and so I went through my whole list. And, and it's kind of like, okay. There are a few things I do without God. And then in the process of a spiritual prayer life and meditation, God spoke back to me and said, John, of course you can do all those things, but you can do nothing of significance that has eternal purpose without me. All that stuff is, that's just temporary. That, that's today and it's gone tomorrow. What I want you to do is I want you to be your brother's keeper. I want you to follow the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. And I want you to add value into people's lives because I value people. And the first thing I share with anybody is that when you go through the Gospels, the thing that you come out with Jesus is, more than anything else, is how he valued people. He valued all of us. People that were like him, people that were unlike him, didn't matter. He valued people because we are God's creation. So my leadership is founded on that beautiful principle of valuing people. Now, how does this picture play out in the long run? Because this is huge. When I look at a leader that has gone wrong, gone south, 
It is almost always Gerard because they failed to value the people they led. So what did they do? They started manipulating the people. Mm. They had power, authority, and so they could move people around and you manipulate people, which is always wrong as a leader, for personal advantage. And so if you look at the world today, the leadership crisis we have in the world today is a manip manipulation problem. We've got leaders who are manipulating people for their own personal good. In fact, I'm, I, I have a nonprofit organization, Equip in the John Maxwell Leadership Foundation, that does transformation in countries around the world. In fact, we have 22 leaders of country that have asked us to come in and teach values. And, and what we, what, what, when I'm one-on-one -on -one with a president of a country, the, you know, the press is out of the way, everybody's cleared the room, it's just the two of us. I always look at him, I say, now, I got a question to ask you. Are the people better off because you're leading them? Or are they worse off? Are, 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 you, are you gaining more than your people or are your people gaining more than you? Because that's the question. If I value people, I'll never put my needs first. I'll never manipulate them. I'll never violate them. Why? Because I value them as a person. So when, we, when you talk about faith and you talk about the greatest leader that ever lived, Jesus Christ, he valued people. So when people say, well, John, you seem to love everybody. I, well, it's because I love everybody. And you seem to believe in everybody. I, well, it's because I believe in everybody. And, and, and John, you seem to want to serve everybody. I, yes, I do. And you want to help. Yes, I do. And lift. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He did those things. So here's what faith allows me and allows you to have an edge. This is an edge. This is a realistic edge that you and I have that a lot of people don't have. Faith allows you, Gerald, he allows you, Gerard, he allows you to be bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Faith allows me to be bigger on the inside than the outside. Now, what happens when I'm bigger, on, I'm talking about character. I'm talking about, yeah. I, okay, I'm, I'm talking about the stuff on the inside of a person, the heart, the yeah. stuff, okay. What happens when I'm bigger on the inside than I'm on the outside? The result is eventually the outside gets bigger. Yeah. Because you cannot give what you do not have. So if I'm bigger on the inside, it's just a picture of the outside expanding because I have the capacity on the inside. Yeah. Most people just turn that the other way. Instead of working on the inside and their faith and, and, and all the stuff that makes us who we are, they go out and say, I gotta go make some money, I gotta go start my companies. And, got, and so they get real big on the outside, but as they're getting big on the outside, they're still small on the inside. Right. And it's only then a matter of time, only a matter of time, yep. until the house falls. The house will fall because it can't stay and maintain that growth and that bigness if I stay small within me, because I will sabotage myself. It's only a matter of time right. until my manipulative spirit or my greed, all the stuff that messes us up as leaders, it'll come to play. And why? Because I didn't build the inside first. So to me, when people say, okay, first of all, the question they ask me all the time, Gerard, is, well, okay, I, I'm a young leader. Who should I start leading? Very simple. Start with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> if you wouldn't follow yourself, why should anyone else follow you? Right. So you start with yourself. Build the inside. Get your faith. Build the character of the person. Yeah. Then you're going to be able to lead others and build organizations and be the success you want to be on the outside. But, but you'll never tip over because you stay solid, because you understand the first person to lead is myself. The first person to grow is myself. It all begins with me, not with someone else then I'm going to be able to do that well with other people. It's interesting to me because I feel so many young men and women right now are missing that, missing that principle, you know, and it's because things have become so convenient to us. We now have this term of like becoming influencers and it's just, you know, now there's people actually following us through, through social media and all these things and people are literally portraying and, and so focused on the external and focused on those metrics and focus on, you know, trying to get people to like them, right? Rather than 
really truly evolving yep. themselves internally. And I feel that uh, you know, it's almost become an epidemic at this point with a lot of the young, the young people that I see that really I, I feel like haven't tapped into that leader within. They're, they're so focused on the external. Right well, now. they are. And it, we live in a star culture. We, we, we live in a culture, it, it's, it's not what you've done, it's who you know. And, and, and so therefore we're, we're taking pictures and, 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 and wanting to, to either be a fan or develop fans. And what I share all the time is the fact that I don't want any fans. I want friends. Now, if I'm going to have fans, I've got to hold myself apart from the people and I've got to be above them and I've got to show them how much better I am than they. And, and, and they kind of, well, wish someday I wouldn't be wonderful. I could be like John Maxwell. I don't want to be. I, 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 want, to, I want to remove the gap. And by removing the gap, I, I, I become a friend of, uh, of yours. I become a friend of people. And I, walk, I, I don't walk in front of them. I walk beside them. And I say, here, come with me. Let's, let, let, let's, let's do this together. And I think that, I think when we look at um, instant gratification, and I, I think when we look at, at you know, it's quick success, in reality, there may be quick fame, but there's not quick success. Right. And, 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 you know, the, almost the speed of the rise determines almost the speed of the fall. It's just yep. a matter of time. And instead of, instead of us uh, using influence to add value to people, we use influence to impress people. Right. And if I use influence to impress people, it's all about me. In fact, in the book, one of the things I talk about is going from soloist to conductor. And the culture you're talking about today is a soloist culture. It's kind of like, it's all about me. So get the picture, me. get the, get the orchestra, get the band, you know, behind me. <laughs> yep. and, and, and it's all about, yep. it's all about me. And one of the shifts that you make, which comes through some maturity is one day I woke up and I thought leadership isn't about me at all. The only gauge that I'm a good leader is how much I've benefited other people. Right. And the more people that say, you know, John Maxwell through his books, through his speaking, I'm a better person. I, I've grown. I've learned. Now, that's the test of my true leadership. It's not how many people know me. It's how many people have had their lives changed by me. So it's not a, like a, a, a popularity contest. It's a, it's a transformational contest. How many people's lives can I add value to and change? And what I've learned again about that is you don't change people by trying to look good or talk about status or position. In fact, you know as well as I do, the best leaders, they're so far over status. And they're so, I mean, dear God, they're so far over position. They just want to be a friend. They, you know, they, they, they've, already, they've already kind of been in that hypey world for a while. And now they've come down and they've said, no, no, the, my lasting legacy isn't how many people know me. My lasting legacy is how many people have been helped by me. Yeah, it's like real human connection. Again. Human connection, that's exactly right. And that gets me off the top of the mountain. You know, when, when people say, you know, wow, it's, you know, it's lonely at the top, I look at them and say, that's not a leadership problem, that's a personality problem. You, know, you, got, a, you got a relationship problem there. If you're on the top all alone, you're not a leader, you're just a hiker. Right. You're just taking a hike on a mountain. You know, what do you do? Get off the mountain, go down to where the people are and, and connect with them, which is very, very important. In fact, in the book on leaderships, I have a chapter on how to go from direction to connection. Mm. Because when I start off as a leader, I, you know, well, just like you, Gerard, we got this vision, we got these dreams. And so I'm just going around spouting my vision to everybody, <laughs> telling everybody where I'm going, and I'm giving directions. I've been I'm there. Saying, Here's yeah. the mountain, come on. And, and I'm just gathering them all together, and, you know, and I'm just pointing, giving directions. And, 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 and one day I, I awaken to the fact that I can't lead people until I first find them. And the moment I realized that, I quit leading by assumption, assuming everybody wanted to get on my train and take my trip. And I started asking questions. I started asking, where are you? And the questions let me connect with them, find the common ground with them. It let me find them. And the moment that I found them and connected with them, now I can lead them. But you can't lead people that you can't find. And so I think it's essential for every leader to value people enough to take time to connect with people. Yeah. Again, I've said it and it made it kind of popular over the years. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
Right. So there are three questions that followers ask every leader. Do you like me? Can you help me? Can I trust you? Do you like me? It's all about relationships, caring. Can you help me? That's all about confidence. In other words, will it get better if I follow you? I know a lot of people I like real well, but I'm not going to follow them. Right. Because they can't help my life to get to another level. Can I trust you? It's all about character. Now that goes back to the inside stuff again. Do I love people? I tell leaders all the time, when you stop loving your people, stop leading your people. You're going to take advantage of it. Trusting that trustworthiness, that's all about, that's all about a character foundation. And so much again, of all this is stuff on the inside that, that people are really wanting to see in us before they follow us. I love how, you know, truly you, you don't really, how much you talk about with the team, right? Like not only when you find that leader within, but really you're only a true leader if you're able to oh, yeah. care about the people around you. And in the book, you have a, a one of the principles talks about team uniformity ver to actually the, the importance right now of team diversity. And oh, that's yes. been something that's been so important to me in my career. I mean, I owe all of my success to my team and throughout my entire career. But I, I like really wanted to touch on that because for me with Elite Daily, the last company, we had so much diversity. And I think that that was like a superpower of our, of yes. our team, oh, right? Of from, course it is. From women to different ethnicities to just people from all different backgrounds. So, you know, can you talk to you about that leadership? Well, it's a huge shift, and, and it, was a, it was a challenge for me because I, in the beginning, first of all, well, in the beginning, let's start at the beginning, I didn't even think of a team. I just had energy, and, you know, and I want to make a difference, so you know, here I go charging the world. Well, you go there, go a few steps, and you realize that you can, the good news is you can make a difference by yourself. The bad news is you can't make a big difference by yourself. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 I, I wrote a book several years ago on the 17 Laws of Teamwork. And one of them is the laws of Mount Everest. And the law of Mount Everest says, as the challenge escalates, the need for teamwork elevates. And it's all, it's all about the fact, if, you're, if you got a Mount Everest in your life, you gotta have a team. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't wanting to climb hills in my life. I was wanting to take mountains in my life. So now, we're, we're, I, I, I've gotta get some people to help me. So, who were the first people I got to help me, Gerard? They were people like me. Yeah, you know, come on, I like you, you like me, <laughs> yeah. we look alike, we talk alike, we've yeah. been alike, we get, you know, whoa. And so now I've got a whole bunch of bland, like a pe people that are just like me. And so we sit down and we start discussing how we're gonna get better. And, and the great news is their ideas were my ideas and their thoughts were my thoughts. And yes, 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 yes. And one day I stopped and said, wait a minute. That's true. I'm not having people around me that complete me. I just have people that are yesing me. I gotta get somebody that'll compliment me. And the only way I'm gonna get people to complete me is I gotta go get somebody who's got a different background than I have. They've gotta be a different age than I am. They've gotta be a different gender. They've gotta, they've, got, they, 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 they've had to go through things I haven't gone through. They have to have experienced things I haven't experienced. And so then I, I began to strategically say, I've gotta go after people that are different than me. And what I discovered is, as you've discovered, is the only way to be a complete team is to have a diverse team. Because I have blind spots. I wrote a book a few years ago called No Limits. And the, the, the key to that book is the first third of the book. I, I tell people the second third, I don't know if you have to read it or not, but the first third is all about awareness about the fact that I have blind spots in my life. You have blind spots. Every, you know, and somebody says, well, can't you on your own, you know, figure your blind spots out? I said, no, they're, they're blind spots. The only way that I can ever receive help in the blind spots of my life and leadership is for somebody like you, Gerard, that's on my team to walk into my life and say, John, you got a blind spot here. You see, I, I tell people they not only need to have an open door policy, they need to have an open ear policy. They need to ask questions and be wanting to hear answers that, that, that doesn't necessarily gel with them in the beginning. I can still remember, I can still remember a staff member coming to me and saying to me one day, John, you don't listen to us. And of course, what did I do? I protested. I talked, I, I began to share, oh, I listen, 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 listen. But I wasn't listening. I went home to my wife, Margaret, and I said, you know, Susan says I don't listen very well. Margaret says, yes, yeah, that, that's good. That's very correct. And all of a sudden I realized 
I wasn't maximizing the people around me because I was directing instead of connecting and because I was, it was coming all from me. And I, I began to say, let diversity lift you, John. Sit down and get their experiences. I remember, oh my gosh, when we left San Diego and I moved to Atlanta to build my companies because it was more centrally located, there's a, a, a large, beautiful, very influential, very effective African-American community in Atlanta. And, and, and I said, I, I need to meet them. So I found a doorkeeper and every six months I would have a lunch with about 20 of them and I did this for three years. And they would come together and they always thought, well, okay, oh my gosh, John Maxwell's buy his lunch. He's going to teach us something. And I didn't want to teach him anything. <laughs> I said, I want to have a meal with him. And I wanted him to tell me about their life. And I just said, you know, tell me about your background and your life. And I would ask questions and we'd have this most wonderful time. And I'd just take notes and I'd get to meet them and know them better. And, and then at the end, I'd give them a book and sign it, but I wouldn't do any of the teaching. I, I just wanted to get to know them. And, I, and, and they became great friends. It was out of that that I started mentoring Bernice King, Martin Luther King's daughter. And, 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 and they would always look at me and say, wow, we thought you were going to come and say something to us or teach us something. And all you really want to do is to know us. Yeah. And that connection happened right there. And so I, I tell people all the time, if everybody's like you, you've got too many people around you that are like you, you want to get people that that really can complement and complete you. And I think that's what diversity is all about. I think to do that, you have to be secure. I want all of my people to speak into my life on the front end, not the back end. I don't want somebody to say, you know what, John, I thought that was kind of a dumb decision. I don't need a history teacher. I want somebody in current events. If I'm getting ready to make a dumb decision, I want them to grab me and I want to say, John, this is not smart. Talk to me. And my team does this every day. I mean. They know how much I need them. So when I go into a room and we're going to do a creative meeting, if I throw out an idea, it's very simple. Make it better. I never leave a meeting without a better idea than what I brought into it. Why? Because I've got people on the team that are diverse. I've got an inner circle that's with me daily. I've got an outer circle that's not with me daily, but they're much more creative. Yeah. And, 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 I, and so the outer circle allows me to have that creativity and, 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 to, and to see the big picture, the inner circle. They kind of want to keep me kind of focused. And, and I need them both. Uh, Linda Eggers is my assistant, been my personal assistant for 31 years, and she's just incredible. Does all my travel. She does everything. I basically do nothing, okay? <laughs> and, and one day I was talking to her about uh, developing an outer circle, and, and I could tell she felt a little threatened, but you know, you mean somebody else is going to come and be an outer circle and what, how much influence they're going to have on you. And, and she asked me the question very sincerely because she felt like maybe she failed me. She said, John, am I not enough? And my answer to her was, no, you're not, Linda. But it's okay. I'm not enough either. None of us are enough. And only through diversity do we get to be enough. And the moment we embrace that, now all of a sudden, I am the summation and the sum of all the people I've got around me. Right. And that's what makes it really work. And I think on, you know, like adding to that, when you have that diversity, I think when you really can lead from a place of w being a great listener, like, you know, having compassion, empathy, so many laws that, you know, I've learned from reading your books that I feel it took me a while to drop that ego to think that like leading meant to be like oh, yeah. you know I, you know you, you know it all and like you mentioned earlier yeah, you're sure. giving that vision it was more so taking that that you know that seat where I'm looking at the people around me with compassion and empathy and trying to understand them listen to them more and I think that um, you know that has been a huge factor for me um, yeah I, I used to be you know as you say that Gerard I, I used to um, think that I had to have all the answers so when I was a young leader, I either had all the answers or I pulled away till I thought I had an answer. And then I would come back and provide the answer. And I, I look back at my young years of leadership of how much I cheated myself and cheated my people from the best answers. Because I was still insecure and I felt like I've got to 
be the sharpest person in the room and I've got to come up with the answer first in this room and, and one day I realized, <laughs> hey, realistically, I'm not the sharpest person in most rooms and I'm not the one that comes up with the best answer. And, and you know, again, when a person really comes to a reality grip of who they are and, and becomes comfortable with, in their own skin, then all of a sudden they, they say, okay, I need you. And, and maybe, maybe the most empowering, encouraging word to a team member is to look at a team member and say, I, I really need you. I, I, I want you to know, I, I'm not sure I can do this without you. What, what's your opinion? What, how, how, would, how would you handle this situation I'm in? Talk to me, give me your thoughts. There is something in inclusive and there's something incredibly empowering in doing that. And I do it not to patronize my people, I do it because most of the time, my people together will give me a better answer than I can come up with by myself. Right. And that's that's the beauty, beauty of, of having a team. You know, teamwork makes the dream work. So the three core things that I took away from this, and there's so many, but one, it's activating faith over fear. And he talks about how by you activating the faith on the inside, that's what allows you to step up and being a leader truly on the outside. You know, the next thing that I really took from him was this concept of you are not enough. Right? Like we always hear people talking about like you are enough, but this concept that you're not enough and therefore you have to learn how to surround, again, surrounding yourself with a diverse team. You know, people that you can really truly help to elevate and understand them from their different backgrounds and different experiences. So really think about that. You're not enough. Go out there and fill in those gaps internally by surrounding yourself with a diverse group. You know, uh, your team, the people you're, you're, you're friends with, the people that you're are your mentors, you know, right? And then realize that like in, you're not truly a leader if you get to the top of the mountain alone. You're just a hiker. So how are you lifting people up with you? And I think that comes with your character, right? How are you truly understanding that you have to be in service of others? Once you activate that leader within, and you have that character, and now you're surrounding yourself with that diverse team, how are you actually caring about them? and it's about how you make them feel. And if you could do that and truly make an impact on the people around you, I think that's what makes a great leader. And I hope this episode will help you to create a leader shift in your life. And make sure to go and cop Leader Shift, the new book by John C. Maxwell. And if you haven't yet, look back at all the books. He's got 20 that are just unbelievable on leadership and business, so many principles. Go and make that leader shift in your life. When you recognize that change is good, the same thing that worked for you yesterday is not gonna work for you today. You have to continue to adapt and grow. So go pick it up, head to leadershiftbook.com, get your copy, and thank you to John C. Maxwell and his entire team, Equip, for allowing us this opportunity to get some insights and sit down with him, tap into this wisdom. It's your host, Gerard Adams. Leaders create leaders. Peace.